Hi, I'm Steve Cuddy, and I'm going to tell you about a simple and convincing water saturation versus height function for reservoir modeling. I will start by reminding us why we need a reservoir model and why an SW height function is required for that model. I will go over some basic definitions and then I will derive a simple and convincing SW versus height function. I will conclude by showing several case studies where we have used this function in reservoir modeling. Why do we need a reservoir model? A reservoir model is like a Lego construction. It has cells where the color represent porosity, permeability or lithofascist type. The lines are wells where the log and core data are collected. This is very limited to compare to the size of the 3D model. This model needs to be initialized with water and hydrocarbon saturations using a water saturation versus height function. The SW height function should also give the fluid contacts and an understanding of net reservoir. The model needs an SW versus height function to initialize the model. This function tells us how the water saturation varies as a function of height above the free water level and how the formation porosity is divided between hydrocarbon and water. Water saturation usually decreases and the hydrocarbon saturation usually increases with height, but this is not always the case as I will show you later. A saturation height function requires that three independent sources of fluid data are consistent. These are the pressure data and the log and core data sets. The function must account for varying permeability and fluid contacts. It must upscale correctly. It should be convincing and should be easy to apply. Before deriving the SW height function, I'd like to clarify several essential definitions that we use in reservoir modeling. The bulk volume of water, or BVW, is the proportion of water in a unit volume of rock. BVW is the product of porosity and water saturation. This is a unit volume of rock, and the blue area represents the pore space, which is full of water. This is what we measure with resistivity tools in clean formation. Not water saturation, but the conductivity of the water volume. This is what we measure in core analysis. Not water saturation, but the amount of water displaced with different pressures. The free water level is an horizontal surface where the capillary forces are zero. It is where the fluid levels will separate out in a very wide borrow. It is the intersection point on the formation pressure plot. Notice that the pressures are linear even in the transition zone. This is because the pressure tester responds only to the mobile phase. The free water level is important as is the start point for the SW height function. The hydrocarbon water contact is the height where the pore entry pressure is sufficient to allow hydrocarbon to start invading the formation pores. This is a surface of variable height, whereas the, the free water level is an horizontal plane. The confusion between the hydrocarbon water contact and the free water level leads to many fields being thought of having multiple contacts. You can forget about the hydrocarbon water contacts as it is not as important as the free water level. The irreducible water saturation is the lowest water saturation that can be achieved in a core plug. This is achieved by flowing hydrocarbon through a sample or spinning the sample in a centrifuge. The irreducible water saturation depends upon the dry pressure 
or the centrifuge speed. The water saturation therefore depends upon the height above the free water level. A minimum irreducible water saturation does not exist and the transition zone extends indefinitely. Here shows water saturation versus height from a large gas field. Water saturation is on the x-axis height above the free water level is on the y-axis and the z-axis, the colour, represents porosity. The excellent dune sands are shown in red, the blue are sandy sapkas and the greens are poor fluvial sands. The ice porosities give the lowest water saturations as you would expect on the left. Where the rock is less than 12 porosity units, the formation can be fully water saturated for hundreds of feet above the free water level as shown on the right. Notice there is considerable scatter in the data. Deriving these functions by porosity bands it would therefore be very difficult. Historically, the S to be height function was derived by porosity bands. These are actually S3 height curves, which were derived and presented to the UK government as part of a field development plan. The highest porosity band is towards the bottom and to the left. The lowest porosities are to the upper right. These curves are mathematically and visually unconvincing as they cross. There are several problems with classical SVI functions. As I've already mentioned, they are visually and mathematically unconvincing as the curves tend to cross. But more so, you need sufficient data in each band to be able to fit the curve. Also, each curve starts at the poor entry pressure as shown on the right. And these points are very difficult to pick. We need a mathematical function to describe the data shown on this plot. This is a serious challenge because of the shotgun spread in the data as shown. But let's see what happens when we change the x-axis, the water saturation, to the bulk volume of water. And I'll show you this on the next slide. This is the same data set but replacing water saturation by BBW. The different lithofascies shown by the different porosities and different colours collapse into a single function. So BBW against height is a single function which can be described mathematically very simply. This function is independent of porosity and rock quality. The bulvum of water is independent of rock properties. And this can be easily verified by using a cross plot. We cross plot the bulk of water for all the wells against the height above the free water level. And we color the, the Z axis by fascist type, zone number, porosity, permeability, grain size, etc. And as the data is completely mixed up, and doesn't uh, drop out to be different bands, therefore we can conclude that the BBW is independent of these properties. Fractals are very useful in reservoir modeling. Let me remind you what fractals are. Fractals are a simple recurring pattern, as shown here. As you zoom in or out, you'll observe the same pattern. Fractals are very useful as they can be described mathematically by a simple recurring algorithm. We see fractals everywhere. We see fractals on the small scale. As shown here, snowflakes are a simple recurring pattern. We see fractals everywhere in plants. The example on the right here is a Roman cauliflower see fractals on the large scale. 
The photograph on the left is the MLS take from outer space. The main and the smaller mountain ridges show the same pattern. On the right, there are river channels. I took this photograph myself when I was, went to Iraq, Basra, to give this presentation. We even see fractals on the largest scale possible, the cosmos. This is from a chapter in Professor Brian Cox's re recent book dedicated to fractals. The cosmic microwave background is a radiation left over from the Big Bang. The features in the cosmic microwave background are acoustic oscillations in the plasma that existed shortly after the Big Bang. This background is scale invariant. If we zoom in on the patterns, they become indistinguishable. The patterns themselves give rise to the galactic superclusters, and these galactic superclusters themselves are built up from galaxies. The universe is fractal all the way down. The fractal is a never ending pattern. Fractals are infinitely complex patterns that look the same on every scale. They are created by a simple repeating process. The name was coined by Biwa Mangelbrock. Other names for fractals are self similarity and scale invariance. Fractals are objects where the parts are similar to the all except for scale. Nature uses simple repeating processes to create complex plants like, like a tree. Let's take this example here from this cartoon. Notice the structure of the tree from a distance. As we get closer, the main branches have the same structure. And as we get closer still, the smaller branches and the twigs show an identical pattern. Nature can create something beautiful and complex by a simple repeating process. How does it do that? Well, the DNA is very simple for the tree. It says, grow, grow a bit, then branch, grow a bit more and branch. And by that simple instruction can design such a beautiful tree. They are mathematically simple. We can verify that something is fractal by using a simple cross plot. Let me show you an example here. The question is, how long is the coastline of Britain? The answer is that it depends on how closely you look at it and how long your measuring stick is. As your ruler gets shorter, the coastline you measure gets longer. When we use a large ruler, we get a poor approximation as shown in purple on the left and a coastline length of n equals nine. As the ruler length shrinks, the measured coastline n increases. A long ruler sees the estuaries, a shorter ruler sees the rivers. This continues all the way down to the sand grains on the beach. As the ruler shrinks, the measured coastline increases. The coastline is fractal because the relationship between R and N, the ruler size and the coastline length, is linear when plotted on these log log scales. And the fractal dimension is the gradient of this line. Let us look at the electrical properties of water. As you probably know, the water molecule is made up of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. But what you didn't probably realise is that the water molecule is polarised, with a distinctive negative end where the oxygen molecule is, and a positive end where the hydrogen molecules are. This causes the water molecules to be strongly attracted to each other and to the reservoir rods as shown here. And the electrostatic force, because of this arrangement, is 10 to the power 36 times greater than the gravitational force. 
Let's have a look at the buoyancy forces in the reservoir. The water is in the reservoir first. When the hydrocarbons migrate into the trap, the buoyancy force exerted by the lighter oil or gas will push the water that was previously in the pore space downwards. However, not all the water is displaced. Some of it is held by those strong capillary forces within the pores. Now, the narrower capillaries, pores with smaller port rows, with a larger surface area, will hold onto the water the strongest. Capillary pressure holds the water up. When two fluids meet in a capillary tube, as shown here, there is a difference in the pressure across their interface. This capillary pressure is caused by the preferential wetting of the capillary walls by the water and gives rise to the familiar curved meniscus shape and causes the water to rise up the capillary. Now the capillary pressure is associated with the pore size. The smallest pores or pore throats hold onto the most water. Consequently, hydrocarbon requires more pressure to enter the smaller pores. The height of the water in a capillary depends upon the capillary pressure, which is determined by the radius of the capillary and the fluid types, as shown by this equation here. As the capillary forces are holding the water up, gravity is trying to pull the water down. The force of gravity on a column of water is determined by the difference between the water and oil densities and is called the buoyancy pressure and is shown by this equation here. The buoyancy pressure is clearly depends upon the difference between these two densities. The water at a given height in the reservoir is determined by the balance between the capillary forces holding the water up and the force of gravity pulling the water down. The oil above the free water level is the mobile phase and only enters the leftover space in the reservoir pores that the water doesn't require. Consequently, at a given part of the pore space within the reservoir will contain both oil and water. And as you know, the percentage of water in the pore space is defined as the water saturation, or SW. The capillary bound water comprises of a continuous column of water within the oil leg with an hydrostatic pressure gradient, as shown by the dotted curve here, which extends below the free water level. The oil is located in the remaining pore space and it's also a continuous phase, but will have a lower pressure gradient, as shown by this solid curve here. Although the oil and water can coexist within the same localized volume of rock, the pressures acting on the two fluids are different. The intersection of the pressure gradients from the oil and the water gives you the free water level. Now it's important to remember the formation pressure tester only sees the mobile phase. The buoyancy pressure, which is the difference in pressure between the oil and water phases, increases with height above the free water level, as shown here. As the buoyancy pressure increases with the height above the free water level, the oil phase will displace more water from the increasingly smaller pore volumes. Therefore, water saturation will tend to de decrease with height above the free water level but I will show you an example where this is not the case. To prove reservoir rocks are fractal by two methods. The first one I'm going to show you here is in the laboratory. Thin sections of reservoir rock are imaged using a scanning electron microscope. And this is shown on the left here. The white areas are the prostate. So it's very easy to calculate the prostate by counting the number of pixels associated with these white squares. But then we have the same problem as we have with the, uh, the coastline of Great Britain. As we have smaller and smaller pixels, we'll count more and more porosity. 
Now, what we do, we plot the pixel size against the porosity. And as the pixel size gets smaller, we see smaller and smaller pores, and the porosity gets greater. But what you see is that there is a relationship between pixel size and porosity, which is a straight line. And this proves that reservoir rocks are fractal in nature. Are very useful in reservoir modeling. As I've shown you, many complex objects can be described by fractals. And fractals are a mathematically simple way of describing complexity, especially in hydrocarbon reservoirs. The rock pore space can be described by this fractal formula, which relates the porosity to the radius of the rock capillaries and the fractal dimension. This can be converted into our BBW SWI function. The, the details of this are in this paper shown below. This is called the BVW or fractal function. This is shown here. It relates the bulk form of water, which is porosity multiplied by porosity, to, to the height above the free water level, and two constants. This is derived from the fractal nature of reservoir rocks, as described in the paper. And it is based upon the bulk volume of water and not water saturation. It is independent of fascist type, porosity and permeability, as I showed you in those previous slides, and just two parameters completely describe your reservoir. The BVW function is easily calculated. BVW is a function of the height above the free water level and two constants. Now, if we take the logarithm of both sides of this equation, we get a linear equation. And this is best shown using this cross plot, where plotted the bulk of water against height for several different fields. This is actual core data. And what you notice is on this log log scale, the BBW function is a straight line. So therefore, even though you've taken hundreds of measurements in the reservoir, you only need two valid points to calculate the BBW function. And this gives you the A and the B. What you also notice is that the B, which is a gradient of these lines, is the same. And that is, is under current research and is determined to be about 0.42. Yes, the answer is 42. So the, so the gradient is, is the same and is inva invariant for all these fields. And A varies between these fields depending on the average pore geometry. Now let me show you the BVW function being used in anger. This is a very difficult data set shown on the right here, which was supplied to the London Petrophysical Society. What you can see here is that the this is a Shaley sand formation and has a much variable permeability and a variable porosity. And what is unusual about this is that the water saturation actually increases with height rather than the other way around. So the challenge was to compare many different industry SWI functions and see which give the best match between the SWI function and the water saturation derived from the resistivity laws. So this was the results of the shootout and shows you the best match between the SWI function and the water saturation derived from the resistivity log. The resistivity log derived water saturation is shown in the left column in black. The water saturation derived from the BBW function or the fractal function is shown in red. And there is a very good match throughout all the different lithofascies between the two water saturations. Permeability is not a required input to this prediction, and it is defined by only two parameters, 
A and B. So the question is, if we can predict water saturation with this, this accuracy, do we always need resistivity logs? <laughs> now, what I mean by that, if we had a case where we had a good function derived from earlier wells in a field, and a later well had a resistivity log which failed, would we rerun the resistivity log in that well if we could predict water saturation as well as this? So what does the BVW function tell us about the reservoir? It says the BVW is a function of the height above the free water level and nothing else. So let's just look at the reservoir model here. On the left hand side, we've got a unit volume of rock at 20 porosity units. On the right, at the same height above the free water level, we've got a unit volume of rock of 10 porosity units. Now what the function is telling us is that the BVW is the same for the 20 PU rock and the 10 PU porosity rock. And the hydrocarbon can only enter the porosity which the water doesn't want. So this gives us actually the net reservoir cutoff. In this case, the cutoff is nine porosity units. How do we know the BVW function predicts the correct water saturation? We can do this as shown here by comparison with core. In this section here, we have got water saturation derived from core, as shown as the blue dots. Water saturation derived from resistivity log, as shown as the black curve. And the red curve shows the SWs derived from the BW function. The water saturations from the core are very accurate as they are Dean and Stark and have these other features. And what we notice when we compare these three different derivations of water saturation is that the BBW function is closest to the core water saturations. The resistivity log is pessimistic because it is affected by the nearby conducted shales. The resistivity water saturation is too high in thin beds. The BVW SWI function actually gives a differential reservoir model, as shown here. We've got the water saturations derived from the resistivity log, which was run yesterday, and represents the current oil in place. The BVW function is derived from the initial oil in place and is shown here in pink. So we have a resistivity log derived water saturations and a BVW derived water saturations. And by comparing the two, we get added information. This upper zone, there is a difference and this shows residual oil saturations, which must be drilled for. Deeper down, though, the water saturations from the function and resistivity log are the same. And this shows a zone of bypassed hydrocarbon. The resistivity log is incorrect in thin beds, close to bed boundaries and where there are conductive shales. Whereas the BVW function ignores thin beds, bed boundaries and shales. We use the BVW function to pick the free water level. This is an actual case study from the North Sea. We have two wells which don't intercept the free water level. Now the BVW function ignores porosity and permeability and gives you a simple curve. And from the trend, we can predict the free water level. The BVW function identifies the hydrocarbon to water contact in the reservoir model. BVW is a product of water saturation and porosity. So therefore, we can derive water saturation by this simple formula. If we do this, the single BVW function splits into multiple SWI functions as shown here. The BVW function gives the hydrocarbon to water contact as a function of porosity. So at five porosity units, 
this is the hydrocarbon to water contact. At temporosity units, this is the contact. And what you notice here is that in low porosity formation, it can be fully water saturated for hundreds of feet above the free water level. BVW function comes with an assessment of its own uncertainty. Partial differentiation of the BVW function allows us to derive the upside, the P10, the downside, the P90, and the most likely P50 BVW functions as shown here. This uncertainty then includes the uncertainty in porosity, resistivity, and scalp parameters. Details of this equation are shown in the paper. With three functions, we're not only able to calculate the most likely hydrocarbon in the reservoir, but we're able to calculate the upside and downside hydrocarbon in place. The BVW function can be used for depth control. Depth is the most important petrophysical measurement. True vertical depth of C can be out by 30 feet due to survey errors and measurement errors. Use the free water level, which is an horizontal plane of zero capillary pressure, can be used to normalize the depths in all the wells, as shown here. In a recent case study, recalibration of well depths based on the free water level change the field's equity between oil, two oil companies by 3%. Let me conclude this presentation by showing the results of a comparison between 11 North Sea fields. We're not only comparing these fields, but we're comparing the log data and the core data from these fields. These fields are very different. Some are gas, some are oil, some are gas condensate. They're very different geological ages and have a, a variety of poroporo characteristics as shown on this cross plot. It shows you the results of this study. We're going to compare the transition zones from these 11 fields as shown here on the right by the different colors. The best transition zones are on the left these give the lowest water saturation for the same porosity. Now, the shape of the transition zone is related to pore geometry rather than porosity or permeability alone. And this is defined by the, the parameter A. Let's compare the log and core derived BW functions. The BW Water saturation height functions are, are linear on log log scales. On the left, we've got the functions from the log data. This represents the data from the free water level to the top of the formation. On the right, we've got the BBW functions from each of the core plots. The log and core functions are the same, irrespective of the, whether they're determined from log data or core data. Therefore, these plots can be used as a quality control of the core data and the log data. Because the functions are the same on the small scale, the core plug scale, as a large scale represents the complete reservoir, this confirms the fractal distribution of the reservoir capillaries. In conclusion, the BBW SWI function is derived from the fractal nature of the reservoir rocks. It can be derived from the electrical logs or the core data by a simple regression of a log-log plot. The logs and core give the same function, consequently they QC each other, and this confirms the fractal distribution of the reservoir capillaries. This function defines the net reservoir cutoff and the shape of the transition zone. It determines the free water level and the hydrocarbon to water contact. And it is independent of rock characteristics, such as fascist type, zone type, porosity, and permeability. You can forget about bed boundary effects and shaliness. And therefore, it is a simple implementation in your reservoir.
The key conclusion is that we should forget about water saturation and we should think about the bulk of water, as shown here. If we move from water saturation to bulk of water, we get a simple SWI function. I am very happy to answer questions and provide free consultancy on SWI functions. Please contact me via the SPWA or via my email address is shown here.